What is up everyone, Steven here, and up until about a month ago, my desktop rig has been booting off of a Samsung 840 SSD. It has 250 gigabytes of space, which is adequate, but I have felt a bit constrained by that capacity. Plus it's a six year old drive, so I recently decided to upgrade. Enter the XPG SX8200 from ADATA. I almost bought this drive on Amazon for 110, but I happened to browse build a PC sales on Reddit before buying and found that Rakuten had the same drive for 94 bucks. At that price, I couldn't resist. And now I have 480 gigabytes of NVMe storage in my desktop. Now that I've used it for a few weeks, I would highly recommend this drive as long as your particular use case can actually benefit from the additional performance. Before we get too far into this, I want to stress that while I am a hardware enthusiast, I am far from being an expert in solid state drives. So if you know something that I don't, and you notice a flaw in my methodology or in my analysis, please do let me know in the comments down below. And if you are considering this drive, take everything I say with a grain of salt, and whatever you do, do not let me be your only source of information about this drive. There are a lot of other people with a lot more experience who have tested this drive and have much more in-depth results. I'll include some links to those uh, videos and articles in the description down below. So with that out of the way, let's talk about synthetic benchmarks. In case you were unaware or you just forgot, synthetic benchmarks are always more impressive than the real world. There are very few real world use cases where you're going to leverage the full performance shown in these tests, especially the sequential tests. Because in the real world, you also have to wait for other components to do their job, such as the CPU. Synthetic benchmarks are just theoretical tests of how fast the drive can perform in a vacuum, meaning they're basically just pretty numbers. But of course they are pretty, so let's take a look. I ran all these benchmarks on several different drives. Of course, my new ADATA SSD is one of them, along with my old Samsung SSD. For perspective, I've also included a hard drive, in this case, a three terabyte Toshiba P300, which is my data and game drive in my desktop. Interestingly, my Samsung SSD seems to have slowed down recently, especially in writes. It's never been as fast as a modern SSD, but check out this graph comparing my Crystal Disk Mark sequential results on the drive when I benchmarked it this past March, compared to a benchmark run when I got the new drive about a month ago. It is noticeably slower in the write test than the SSD I use in my laptop, which is a Team Group L5 Lite 3D. Because of this, in all the synthetic tests I'm showing you, I'll also include this drive as benchmarked in my laptop as an indication of roughly how much performance you can expect from a low-end but still modern SSD. First, the Crystal Disk Mark sequential test. As expected, the 8200 annihilates all the other drives. NAND flash is really fast, and the NVMe standard allows it to perform much faster than these same flash chips would perform if they were connected through SATA. This graph also shows the lackluster write performance of my old drive, which is actually not that much faster than my hard drive. The first random test is the most impressive test in my opinion. The 8200 absolutely destroys the P300 by a factor of over 1,500. It's absolutely insane, and the other SSDs are far behind the 8200, but also far ahead of the hard drive, which just looks pathetic in this case. When you drop the thread count down to just one, even with the increased Q depth of 32, the margin shrinks quite a bit. The hard drive performs virtually the same in this test as in the last test, which is typical of a hard drive, illustrating the fact that hard drives are not one bit faster in multi-threaded tasks than in single-threaded tasks. In other words, if you give it several things to do at once, it'll still just do them one at a time. That's all it can do. SSDs, on the other hand, will do multiple things at once if they are given multiple things to do. So when you drop them down to a single thread, they slow down quite a bit. And they slow down even more when you drop the Q depth down to one. And while the hard drive maintains its sluggish write performance, it actually slows down even more on reads. And of course, even in this test, all the SSDs are tremendously faster than the hard drive. Let's move on to the next benchmark, which was run in Linux. This is using the GNOME Disk Utility, a Linux program that comes pre-installed on Ubuntu and comes with a handy disk benchmarking tool. First, a customized sequential test with 20 consecutive one gigabyte samples. This shows the strongest performance we've seen yet from the new drive, benching even higher than in Crystal Disk mark. Next, the default test uses 100 consecutive 10 megabyte samples. This was actually the most amazing test to me because the 8200 finished the sequential test in just five seconds. Just take a look at this. 
It's absolutely insane. At this smaller sample size, the drive does take a small hit to read and write performance, although it's still crazy fast. Other drives also slowed down a bit, but still performed quite well relative to the hard drive. The last test measures access time or latency, and it's the biggest reason why I like this benchmark. It shows a huge gap between a spinning drive and a solid state drive. Remember that a hard drive has to physically rotate the platters and move the read-write heads in order to locate a particular sector, while an SSD just requests the data from a particular location. Thus, access time is astronomically faster on a solid state drive and faster still on the modern drives. Let us look now at some tests with some more real world relevance. Starting with a test of several folder operations running on a folder containing 18 gigabytes of VMware files within Ubuntu 18.04, all running on an ext4 file system. I compressed the folder using the tar command, duplicated the resulting tar file, then decompressed it again with tar. I do suspect that the compression and decompression was basically just duplicating the data on the drive, but regardless, it does show that moving large files around within the drive is really fast. That said, if you're copying to or from a different drive, these speeds will be limited by that other drive. Next, startup times measured for a variety of situations, including Windows, several programs, and several games. Before we look at the data though, let me briefly explain my methodology. I've gotten in the habit of timing startups three times in a row, then averaging the three runs. It's not a particularly realistic way of assessing performance, but realism wasn't the reason behind adopting it. I adopted this method early this past summer when I upgraded my laptop to its current SSD from a hybrid drive. In comparing the data between the two drives, I wanted to err on the side of understating the performance difference, being a bit generous to the hybrid drive. And I estimated that a hybrid drive would benefit disproportionately from running such tests multiple times in a row. That way it could begin to cache those files. I'm not sure exactly how this methodology affects solid state drives, although I have noticed that the first run, which is most likely indicative of real world startup times, sometimes showed the largest difference between the drives. So for several of these startup tests, I will show the average times as well as the first run time. Starting with Windows and the new drive, performed no more than two seconds faster than my previous SATA drive in my computer. You may notice a few odd things about this chart. First off, the startup and restart times are surprisingly long, both for my old drive and my new drive. Also, my laptop SATA SSD solidly outperforms my new NVMe drive. These observations demonstrate that the firmware on my desktop motherboard, for whatever reason, is unusually slow to start up, and it's kind of annoying. My laptop SSD, of course, is starting up Windows on my laptop, whose firmware is much faster. And my testing methodology for these tests was to start the stopwatch when I pressed the power button. In retrospect, it may have been wise to remove this variable by only starting the stopwatch once Windows starts to load. But it's too late for that at this point. I've already wiped the old drive clean, so make of this data what you will. Moving on to a few small programs which start up really fast on either drive. They're both fast enough that my response time on the stopwatch could actually cause some significant variance. So with all these programs, you can expect nearly identical performance with any decent SSD. Once you look at some larger programs, the NVMe drive actually has a chance to pull ahead, especially when you look at first run results. That is, excepting GIMP, which was only slightly faster on the first run, yet much faster on subsequent runs. This makes me suspect that Vegas and Premiere require several larger files where the NVMe drive can stretch its legs, where GIMP mostly uses a lot of small files, putting the drives in a situation where the performance gap is much narrower. In game startup times, you might expect some major gains, although it very much depends on the game. Duck game actually started up a bit slower on the new drive, although it's close enough that it could just be random variation. Overwatch, on the other hand, does show a fairly significant difference, especially when you look at first run results. Note that Overwatch was tested only going from the battle.net launcher into the main menu. Since it's an online only game, loading into the actual game, including maps and player models, would introduce too much variation with network, traffic, and latency. And unfortunately, I don't have data for very many games simply because I didn't have many games installed on my Samsung SSD. Most of my games were, and still are, stored on my Toshiba P300, which is obviously going to be a lot slower. Or is it? Just for kicks, 
I threw together a chart comparing Arc Survival Evolved starting up from my hard drive compared to my new SSD. And the hard drive was actually marginally faster getting to the main menu, although the SSD pulled ahead when entering the game, especially on the first run. Note that for these tests, I loaded a single player local game, so it shouldn't be affected by network traffic. With all these performance figures out of the way, let's talk about thermals. It's not a topic that I was originally planning on covering, however, I got a comment on the unboxing video from a fellow who bought this same drive, installed it in a MacBook Pro, and experienced some strange temperatures, 30 to 40 degrees hotter, with the included heatsink attached. That's exactly the opposite of what you'd expect. A heatsink or heat spreader is supposed to decrease temperatures by spreading out the heat over a larger surface area. So I did some testing on my own to try and, and figure out what was really going on. I wanted to remove my heatsink so that I could see if it made a difference in my computer, but in attempting to do so, I found that the strength of the adhesive would have made it remarkably difficult. While trying to pry it off, I even bent the heatsink a little bit. Basically, it looks like once the heatsink is on, it's pretty hard to get off, and it will not look the same after doing so. Plus, I wouldn't count on the adhesive even working after being removed. But I do still have data from the drive with the heatsink on, and I think we can glean some useful information from this. In my case, literally, the drive idles in the low 30s, then goes up to around 55 when stressed. Since it sits right under my GTX 1060, which uses an open air cooler, GPU temperatures do have an impact on temperatures. When the GPU is stressed and the fans are spinning, the drive is a little hotter on idle and a little cooler under load. I think this means that the hot air from the GPU is somewhere between those temperatures, perhaps around 45 degrees. These results are right in line with what DC found without the heatsink, which makes me wonder why his drive was so much hotter with the heatsink on. It's a bit of a baffling phenomenon. Of course, a laptop has much less airflow than a typical desktop, but that should affect temperatures whether the heatsink was attached or not. So perhaps the heatsink was just not attached securely enough to the drive, or perhaps the heatsink added enough thickness for it to make contact with the chassis of the machine. This may have blocked airflow to the actual flash chips and controller on the drive, or if the chassis was hotter than the drive, it may have made the drive run even hotter. That said, if the chassis got hotter than the drive, then it would also be too hot to use on a lap anyway, so it's not too likely in my opinion. But beyond that, I have a hard time explaining what's going on here, so if any of you have any theories, definitely let me know in the comments down below. So with all that out of the way, here's the answer to the $100 question. Is NVMe even worth it? As with so many other things in tech, it depends. If you're a casual user, you should just stick with SATA. An SSD in general will absolutely be worth it, as Windows is borderline intolerable when running on a spinning disk. But a casual user doing casual user things such as web browsing, word processing, and movie watching will not saturate a SATA SSD. Instead of spending the extra money on NVMe, use it to get a bigger drive or just save it to your bank account. You might consider a SATA SSD that uses the M.2 form factor for the sake of aesthetics, cable management, and a smaller PC perhaps, although they do tend to be a bit pricier than their 2.5 inch counterparts. If you're a gamer, you should consider NVMe. The benefit to game loading times will depend on the game, but it may be worth it. Modern AAA titles take up a lot of drive space, so it's likely that they'll need to load a lot of that information from the drive and benefit significantly from a faster drive. On the other hand, casual or indie games, especially ones that don't take up much space on your hard drive, probably won't see a significant improvement, if any improvement at all. But in all these cases, it very much depends on the game. So if you can, look up tests online comparing the specific games you are likely to play running on a SATA SSD compared to an NVMe SSD. Or just stick with SATA because the difference probably is not going to be night and day. If you are building a workstation, you should definitely consider NVMe. Many professional workflows involve dealing with a lot of large files and will thus be accelerated by a fast drive. Casual video editing, such as the simple edits that I do, doesn't seem all that taxing on a drive. But at higher resolutions, bit rates, or frame rates, or just in projects where you have a lot of large video files, this could be a significant bottleneck, especially if you do it frequently. 
If this sounds like your use case, you should definitely consider NVMe. Although for workstation use, you should also consider a higher end pro grade drive such as the 970 Pro, which will give you much better sustained write performance and better endurance. Of course, in any case, you need to consider compatibility. To use a drive such as this one, you will need an M.2 slot that supports NVMe drives. If you don't have such a slot, you'll need to stick with SATA drives or upgrade your system. So with all that out of the way, if you are considering NVMe, this drive, in my opinion, should be right up at the top of your list. The Samsung 970 Evo and Pro are pretty much the best NVMe drives you can get, but they're also the most expensive. This ADATA drive seems to get nearly the same performance as those drives, but at a much lower price. The 500 gigabyte model of the 970 Evo, for example, will generally set you back around 150 on Amazon. This is actually a pretty good price, and if you want the fastest NVMe drive around, this is it. But the SX8200, which is about as fast as generally around 110 on Amazon, that's 40 bucks you can spend on a one terabyte hard drive to go with it. Plus this drive has the slight advantage of coming with a small heat spreader, which aside from having the logo upside down on most motherboards, looks pretty sleek. And you actually get a longer warranty, five years from ADATA instead of three from Samsung. Another drive you may come across is the SX6000. I would hesitate on this one, as its speeds are much lower than the 8200. It only claims 1000 read and 600 write, so the performance gains over SATA are likely to be much thinner. And in the circa 500 gigabyte capacity, it's almost the same price as the much faster SX8200. If your budget is small enough that you would only be able to afford the 128 gig model, you should probably just get a SATA SSD, which will allow you to either bump up to a larger drive or just save some money. Of course, if you are going to get a solid state drive this weekend, including Black Friday and Cyber Monday is a great time to get one. In fact, if you are getting one at Black Friday pricing, the 970 Evo is a much easier sell given how much smaller the price difference is between it and this A data drive. So for me personally, this drive has not been earth shattering. In my particular use case, I occasionally do things that benefit from the additional speed. But in the time since I've gotten the drive, I haven't really done those things except for the purposes of this video. So I haven't yet been blown away by the overall experience. That said, there have been a few aspects beside the performance that have been rather nice. It is nice to be able to remove a SATA data and power cable from my case. Although to be fair, they were already hidden behind the motherboard tray, out of sight, out of mind. And it is nice to have a larger SSD as I now have enough space to have a separate partition for Linux again. And now that I don't need my old drive as a boot drive anymore, I have it in an external enclosure as a portable SSD, which for some reason does not work on the front USB ports on my computer. Basically, most of the benefit I've gotten from this drive have in from the M.2 form factor and the larger capacity, not from it being NVMe. So maybe I would have been better off with a Samsung 860 Evo in the M.2 form factor, though it looks like it might have actually been a bit more expensive than the 8200. There are some cheaper SATA-based M.2 drives out there, although you will probably still end up paying a bit more than you would for a 2.5 inch SATA drive, where I've seen circa 500 gig drives as low as 60 bucks. In conclusion, if you're ready to jump to NVMe, the SX8200 is one of the best value options out there, given current pricing. But you really should think seriously about your particular use case and whether or not NVMe actually makes sense for you. SATA SSDs still perform very well in almost every situation and they're now cheaper than ever. So be sure to consider the market as it stands when you're in the market for a drive. Thanks for watching and I'll figuratively see you in the next one. off of a Samsung SSD 840. SSD 840 or 840 SSD? I think it's just 840 SSD, yeah. It has 250 gigabytes of space, but it is... Let's just reword this, A. Eh? Do a little uh, rewriting on the fly. Enter the XPG SX8200 from ADATA. Before we get too far into this, I want to stress 
Since it sits right under my GTX 1080, 